very similar speaker. Nancy is the Frederick Kendrick Prince Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago. That's a mouthful, but uh, we, know, we all know Nancy. Uh, we all know her work. We've written, her, we've uh, read her papers. So we have done much more than read her papers. We have studied them. We have taught them. We have written problems set from them. So, you know, um, these are the papers that really form a common language. And it's a common language that is very well represented in this society. And Nancy has been a constant friend uh, of this society. So I think it's fair to say that if you don't know her or her work, it's probably time to go back to grad school. Now, Nancy's work spans a large number of areas. She has seminal substantive contributions on fiscal and monetary policy, economic theory, growth, even international trade. And if that was not enough, she has, through her wonderful monographs, been one of the main architects of the mathematical structure that today forms you know, the backbone of modern macroeconomics. It's very hard to imagine the field of macroeconomics, and certainly for me to imagine my PhD without recursive methods in economic dynamics that has been, you know, uh, constant companion throughout my, my career, and I'm sure through most of your careers. And, uh, and so that makes Nancy, you know, one of the top economists in the world, and we're very lucky to have her here. Her rigor, discipline, and an unapologetic drive to make economics a serious scientific discipline, a serious scientific endeavor, is really unparalleled in the profession, and we owe her a big thanks for that. So thank you so much for it. On a more personal note, it is particularly lucky for me to stand here in my hometown at my college, at the first, at, at the SCD, which was my first professional conference, and be able to welcome Nancy and thank her for being a friend and a critic, sometimes a very harsh critic, but always a helpful critic. Uh, and so please join me and welcome her in the warmest possible way. Esteban, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I hope I can live up to it. So it's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this lecture. So my topic today is technology diffusion, which is a little bit of a, a kind of new uh, uh, area for me. So, you know, why do we care about technology diffusion? But for me, the key thing is that it's at least part of the answer to the very important question, you know, where, where does TFP growth come from? Like, I, for me, it's hard to imagine, you know, all the, the growth we've had in the U.S. and the rest of the developed world without improvements in technology. And so, uh, to understand uh, that process, it seems to me, we have to understand something about the adoption of technologies. And the same is perhaps even more true if we look across countries and look at the developing world, um, where you know, adoption of technologies that have been you know, uh, produced outside has to be a, a, a critical part of their growth process. So today I'm going to focus on diffusion of producer technologies. And I carved out that niche um, because I think it's, you know, my, my hope, well, first of all, diffusion is critical for producer technologies. You know, if somebody develops a new piece of equipment, you know, it's only important for society at large. It's only going to lead to uh, growth uh, for the whole economy if producers in the relevant industry adopt it. Um, and if we look across the globe, the same is true. 
Um, now I'm going to focus on technologies as opposed to ideas. Um, you know, Bob Lucas and many others have modeled diffusion of ideas, which I think is important too. You know, I started out thinking about technologies because I was, uh, I had a hope that they were going to be more easily measured and uh, perhaps uh, that would be useful. Well, I'll come back to that at the end. Um, you know, maybe I was a little too optimistic on that point. Oh, wrong one. Okay, so I'm going to ignore R&D and other mechanisms for uh, invention of new technologies. Those are important, but that's not my subject today. I'm going to ignore consumer goods, mainly because I think the adoption of consumer goods is going to be explained by a different set of factors, namely tastes and income. Um, and I'm not going to talk about uh, high-yielding varieties. There's an enormous literature on that. I think it's an important subject. But again, I think it, you know, it might be a slightly different set of uh, you know, uh, factors that are important for the diffusion of those uh, technologies. Um, that could probably be a plenary lecture all by itself, but you know, not by me. Okay, so and, and the discussion today is going to be, it's going to be very selective, um, and I'm not going to have a literature review because you know, that would take a whole, the whole hour. Okay, so the outline for the rest of the talk is I'm going to look at the evidence on diffusion for a couple of very particular technologies that have been well studied with U.S. data. Um, and focusing, you know, they focus on the question, you know, how fast are these technologies adopted? Um, so what explains, you know, the differences in adoption speed across you know, say, uh, different technologies. Uh, then I'm going to look at the uh, considerably less detailed evidence on cross-country diffusion of some new technologies. And here, you know, it's just the, the evidence is much less good, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. And, uh, you know, I think you'll see why, like, I don't think we're ever going to get anything as clean as what we have for these few U.S. examples. Uh, then I'm going to look at some uh, evidence on productivity in agriculture. And my notion here is that uh, I think it's a sector that can be well studied as uh, slightly separate from the rest of the economy. So and especially for developing countries, you know, a two-sector model with agriculture and non-agriculture as the two sectors has been used a lot and I think, you know, very effectively. And I think uh, technologies could be uh, studied in this way. Um, and then, you know, I'm basically a theorist, so then I'm going to sketch a model of technology adoption that I think could be, you know, adapted to, uh, you know, look at the evidence we have and maybe think about, you know, questions for the future. Okay, so I'm going to start with a couple of, you know, classic examples. So Grillicus's study of the adoption of hybrid corn, you know, I think it's that paper, it's kind of like the Bible. Everybody cites it, but, you know, nobody reads it. So I actually read it, and you're going to get to see, you know, the, the executive summary of what Grillicus did. So he was looking at the adoption of uh, hybrid corn. Uh, I guess I could look for it. So... And here's a figure from his paper. And here are plots of, this is the diffusion in five different states. Uh, the hybrids were introduced at, you know, uh, gradually over time. So we'll talk about that. And then there's a, you know, this is, a, you know, like a, these diffusion curves are all pretty well, dis, you know, fitted by logistics with different, uh, somewhat different shapes. And uh, here, those has had very good data. The agriculture is very well measured. That's another fact. And so this is the fraction of uh, 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 output that's produced with the hybrids. Okay, so diffusion rates vary by geographic region. 
Um, and Grillicus's goal was to explain the differences in the adoption rates. All right, so first he approximated each, uh, each curve with a logistic, um, and then uh, looked at three parameters for this logistic, the date of entry, and he defines entry as 10% penetration. Um, zero is always kind of dicey. Uh, the slope of the logistic curve, and then what he calls the ceiling, so the long run rate of penetration. And he runs three sets of regressions with a couple of right-hand side variables uh, in each one, and you know we'll, we'll, we'll see what those right-hand side variables are. Okay, so yeah, most of you, or many of you probably know a little bit about the U.S. So Iowa is just the heart of the Corn Belt. Indiana and Illinois are also like, you know, Corn Belt states. And then when you move to Wisconsin, there's a lot of corn, but not quite as uh, concentrated. And then, you know, and so on. By the time you get out to Alabama, you know, there's some corn in Alabama, but it's not a major, not the major crop. Okay, then I'm going to, uh, for my second example, I'm going to look at an old study of Mansfields where he looks at uh, 12 innovations in four industries. So the industries are uh, coal, iron and steel, brewing and railroads. And these, you know, a, a somewhat different feature about these uh, technologies is that they require investment in uh, equipment. So, like, there's a big capital cost involved. Um, and his data is considerably less good than Grillicus's. He has the fraction of firms. He looked at the major, the largest firms in these industries. And so he only has the fraction of firms, not the fraction of output. Um, and here, the, you know, a feature of this data is that the speeds of adoption <coughs> vary tremendously. So uh, here are his curves. And you can see in the top panel, there's one that came in lightning fast. The first one, you know, came in quite slowly. And then there's a later one that came in lightning fast. So these speeds of adoption are really all over the place. The slopes are uh, vary a lot. Um, yeah, so if you look at 50% penetration, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the quickest industry, that was less than a year. And in the slowest one, it's 15 years. So just a footnote, that, that, that rapid penetration, instantaneous penetration, that was uh, 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 aluminum steel cans for beer, metal beer cans. So apparently beer drinkers had no, no difficulty uh, adopting, adapting to uh, metal cans. Okay, so what explains the differences in adoption speed? So for Grillicus, the variation is geographic. Um, so uh, if he looks at the, for the date of entry, he has to think about who the supplier of the seeds were. You know, farmers can't plant these hybrids unless somebody, unless the sellers are offering the seeds. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture had a big role in developing the seeds, and then you know the seed suppliers you know also had a role. And uh, he finds that entry, you know, it was earliest in these Corn Belt states, so that was surely a deliberate choice by the USDA and the seed companies. And entry is well, descri well described by market density, which affects the marketing costs, and, uh, and whether there had been entry in a contiguous market. These hybrids have to be developed separately for every region, um, and you know a region and something like much smaller than a state, and it reduces that having a marketable hybrid in a region next door is a good starting point for developing one more hybrid. Um, the the rates of adoption are quite well explained by average corn acreage per farm, and the superiority of the hybrids. And then superiority, um, two measures here uh, work quite well. One is just increase in yield uh, that uh, taken from survey data. And the other is the uh, pre-hybrid yields. So it was you know, either true or at least believed to be true that the hybrids increased yield by 20%. 
So in a higher yielding area, you're taking 20% of a higher base. The hybrid is more profitable. Okay, and the long run rates of penetration depend on uh, kind of the same factors. Okay, and finally, I want to look at, uh, um, okay, and then the diffusion, uh, excuse me, and the, and the diffusion in Mansfield's data. So here, he's looking only at the slopes. His, his diffusion curves all start at zero and go to 100%. And he finds that profitability is uh, important and the cost of adoption. And he, he's getting his information on these just from you know, interviews with the managers of the adopting firms. And then he has different industry constants. Now, he gets, he gets really superb fit, but you know, he's got six right-hand side variables and only 12 observations, so that helps a lot too. But if you want to get an R squared of 99 in cross section, there you go. Okay, for the next example, I'm going to take uh, Manuel and Sachadri's uh, paper on tractors. So, again, agriculture is very well, uh, you know, there's a lot of excellent data, and tractors have been the subject of a lot of study. And for, you know, a long time, it was kind of a puzzle why adoption was so slow. So they came in around 1910, but adoption wasn't really, didn't really take off until the 1940s. So the authors here show that, you know, that they have, a, they have a rather elaborate model. It's not just a diffusion curve. They have a general equilibrium model. They have some, they have vintages of tractors. But in the end, their, their kind of takeaway is that uh, quality kept, quality of the tractors kept improving. So the quality adjusted price of tractors kept falling. Although that, the early improvements in qual, you know, the decline in quality adjusted price came rather early and adoption came later. And it was really the increase in wage rates. So, uh, uh, and that happened during the 40s. Presumably it was part of the, you know, the war, wartime you know, shortage of labor. So that made tractors more profitable. So here we see uh, tractors coming in. This is just number of tractors. And you see it rose quite a lot in the 40s. And here are some their prices. And you'll see that the thing that really took off in the 40s is the wage. So the quality adjusted price, the price fell early then the nominal price bounced all around, but quality kept improving, so the quality adjusted price kind of stayed pretty low. And here's a figure from a paper of Chen's. He has, you know, the diffusion curves for tractors in the U.S. So it does have, it has a, you know, a logistic shape, and really the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s were the periods of very rapid adoption. Okay, so these are, you know, these U.S. examples, this is like, the, this is the nice clean data. There's evidence on costs, evidence on profitability. Now when we move to the cross-country data, you know, it's just the evidence is much more limited. So, the, you know, if you want to think about diffusion across countries, I think that the issue is like, what exactly do you want to try and think about? So there are two types of evidence on cross-country diffusion. Um, and they both, you know, studies using both kinds of evidence, they are aimed, they've been aimed more at trying to look at country characteristics that predict adoption. Okay, so one set of studies looks at particular technologies where we have evidence of, uh, about, you know, sales in, you know, a, a, a set of countries. Um, and that's, you know, the limit there is just, you know, what do we have data on? Um, and the answer is, like, not that much. And the other exploits bilateral trade data, which is um, uh, sort of much richer. So the fact is, um, you know, capital equipment is a highly traded good, uh, very highly traded, and there's excellent data on trade. So to me, this seems like the, maybe the best, uh, 
you know, angle for trying to think about cross-country adoption. Okay, so uh, Caselli and Coleman have a nice paper where they look at uh, adoption of computers. Um, now, if you think about, you know, you compare adoption of computers with adoption of, say, tractors, I mean, the problem is computers are used all over the place. So we can't look at just computers in general and get some idea of a, about a, a diffusion speed. We would have to think about computers for some particular use, and I think it would be very hard to gather data on you know, like where those computers are going. A lot of them are even you know, consumer goods. People you know, have their laptops at home, or their kids have their laptops. But they, all right, so they find that among non-exporters, schooling levels have an important effect on computers. So apparently they're kind of complementary to education. And you know, there's a, you know, if you look at the, you know, the time series for these, it's just, you know, they all, you know, the countries are very different from each other, but they all kind of move up, you know, over time. So more people adopt computers, and even, you know, like the. Uh, uh, <laughs> Economics is getting everywhere. So, um, uh, and, you know, people replace their computers. Computers are, you know, it's a durable good, but not that durable. Quality goes up, price goes down. Okay, then there's a paper by Coleman and Hoban. They look at a, a broader set of technologies, and again, they just regress uh, adoption rates on uh, some country characteristics. Um, I would say, for my purposes, this study is. Uh, the problem is a lot of these, a lot, a lot of their products are consumer goods, so it's um, you know you have to take this a little bit with a grain of salt. But they find that uh, earlier adoption is predicted by human capital per capita GDP and openness. And so, to me, you know, one thing you could think about is if at least some of these technologies are you know capital using and labor saving. Uh, human capital and per capita GDP could be proxies for wage rates. All right, I think I'm going to skip that. Okay, then the second type of uh, uh, evidence, as I say, it uses this cross-country data. So, and the starting point here is that many innovations are embodied in a capital good. So if you want to adopt the new technology, you have to buy the new piece of equipment that you know, lets you do that. Um, so Eaton and Cordham, uh, in their 2001 paper, they, they, just, they looked at trade in capital goods, and they pointed out like two very interesting facts. Um, one is that most countries in the world import most of their equipment. Um, so, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent is uh, not uncommon. So just what share of equipment comes through imports. And that's especially true of developing countries. And uh, secondly, a large fraction of those imports come from countries, exporting countries that are R&D intensive. And that's true for both, you know, the, 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 the uh, importing countries that are, uh, you know, developed and not so developed. So um, uh, they look, they, they pull out a set of seven countries that are especially R&D intensive and look at the share of, uh, you know, imports that are coming from that group. Um, and I've updated those numbers. Uh, by that time, the, the big seven has changed in composition a little bit. China, Taiwan, and Korea have come in. Um, and the, the concentration is a little less extreme than it was in 1985, but there's a kind of updated version of Eaton and Cordham's figure. So on the horizontal axis is the share that came from the uh, big seven in 1985, and the vertical axis is the share in 2000. Most of the points are below the 45 degree line, so it's not as concentrated as it was, you know, it was getting less concentrated over time. It's still quite concentrated, so you know, you know, the the, the high uh, R and D countries are supplying a lot of these uh, capital goods, but then it's just even the ones that are not coming from there. It's just a huge share of total imports, of, 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 of to, a huge share of total investment in equipment. 
Okay, so Caselli and Wilson use this bilateral trade data. All right, again, they're trying to like look at the question, what country characteristics help you know predict adoption patterns? So they use this data. They aggregate. It's it's pretty detailed data. Um, they aggregate into nine categories of capital goods, and they want to relate the share of imports uh, in each category to country characteristics. All right. So they set out a, a model um, where each type of equipment. So uh, categories are electrical, non-electrical, office equipment, communication equipment, boat. All right. Each each capital of each type is combined with homogeneous labor uh, to produce a, an intermediate. And then these intermediates are go into kind of a standard CES uh, production function. All right, so there's the intermediate, uh, the production function for intermediates. And countries differ by this uh, uh, productivity factor AIP, so which is specific to country and intermediate. Okay, now the thing about this model is it, it says that uh, the, the share of equip these, all right, these productivity parameters, we don't have any direct way of looking at them, but the model says the shares of equipment in each of these categories should be proportional to the uh, relative productivities. So, we observe um, the imports of these equipment of the equipment, and we can just you know sort of use the import shares as a proxy for the stock shares, and then that's a proxy for these productivity parameters. So for the empirical work, they exclude big exporters of equipment. I think they take out 15 countries, um, and so. All right, so now we're going to think about these uh, import shares. What do they depend on? So uh, they, they posit a model where these productivity parameters in turn depend on country characteristics. So there's, there's the things that affect these country uh, productivity parameters. Um, and so you get a regression equation that says these import shares should be related to country characteristics. And then you can look at the loadings on the characteristics to try and say, you know, what, uh, what drives, you know, imports of different types of equipment. Um, okay. So what do they find? They find, they, they, they have a, you know, a, a long list of right-hand side variables. Um, and uh, they find human capital is complementary. They have a couple of measures of education. Human capital is complementary to certain categories of equipment, um, not surprisingly. So electrical and communication equipment, professional goods. And income per capita is also complementary to computers and electrical com equipment. Now, the bad news is they're Regression results are, you know, not very robust, and I'm not dumping on them. They say that themselves right up front in the paper, so it's, they're kind of sensitive to what you put in or leave out of these regressions. But I take this as at least suggestive that, you know, uh, wage rates across countries might have a uh, some uh, role in predicting which types of equipment are imported. Um, they also do some other regressions that suggest the med they have a very broad sec you know cross section of countries and the median country is really not so eager to import high R and D goods. Okay, so you know what's What's my conclusion from this? I, I think this kind of evidence about a few types, of, you know, just the cross-section, these regressions, just like looking at country characteristics, I find them, you know, just, I mean, they're kind of interesting, but it's not nearly as compelling as thinking about, you know, profitability and cost of adoption. So as economists, you know, I think it, it's, it's worth trying to think about whether if we go back to, um, 
is there a way we can try and smoke out, you know, uh, patterns of adoption, you know, that and and look at the role of, you know, relative prices, wage rates, and so on in in governing adoption. Okay, and and so now I want to talk a little bit about agriculture because, as I said earlier, to me, like a, a maybe a nice lens for thinking about this problem is that. Uh, a model with agricultural, uh, two sectors, agricultural and non-agricultural goods, um, could be a lens for thinking about uh, penetration of new uh, technologies. Now, why agriculture? Um, I think there, there, uh, there are two reasons. You know, first, you know, inputs and outputs are measured relatively clean in agriculture. I mean, many countries in the world first collect, they collect good data on agriculture, so we have measures of outputs. And the outputs are often in you know, physical quantities. There's not that much, you know, change in the products. So we get, you know, really uh, good measures of changes in productivity. Um, and uh, uh, inputs are, and, and the second is that the inputs in agriculture are, uh, to a large extent, distinct from the ones used in the rest of the economy. You think about, you know, tractors, reapers, seeds, harvesters, all that stuff. It's used in agriculture and nowhere else. So if you thought about trying to categorize imports of equipment and maybe other kinds of imports as well, you could, uh, I think, fairly cleanly say which, like, quite a few categories that go only to agriculture. You're going to miss some stuff. You know, pickup trucks are used all over the place, but uh, you have a nice, uh, nice division. So to me, it's maybe a nice laboratory for thinking about, uh, you know, penetration of technologies, um, and also it's important just because agriculture is so important for developing countries. All right, so I want to look at just some some facts. So um, these are very familiar, I'm sure, to some of you. So if we look at cross-country patterns in agriculture, um, first, you know, when we look at poorer countries, they have lower TFP. They have lower TFP in everything, but it's particularly low in agriculture. So, and this is kind of a stunning fact because poor countries, most of their employment is in agriculture, and that's the sector where, you know, so seems they have a relative, a comparative disadvantage. So that's well documented. Um, so the per capita, the per capita GDP of the richest 5% is 34 times higher than the poorest 5%, but in agriculture, the productivity gap is, you know, a, a multiple of 78. So it's, 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 it's big. Uh, secondly, the same is true of capital intensity. So, uh, Poor countries have lower capital t intensity everywhere, but it's especially low in agriculture. Um, and third, in, as I said, in poor countries, a, a big share of employment is in agriculture. Um, and you see these exactly these same patterns if you look at time series in the U.S. Okay, so there, the top panel here is GDP per worker. Uh, agriculture is green, uh, non-agriculture is yellow. Um, and you see, all right, so as you move to the you know, richer deciles, productivity is going up in both sectors, but relatively faster in agriculture. Um, and the bottom panel just shows uh, relative uh, uh, GDP per worker. Uh, this is, uh, looks at capital intensity across countries by income level. Uh, so the blue is, blue is non-agriculture, red is agriculture. And you see uh, the uh, agricultural capital intensity rises faster in agriculture as you move from poor to rich. Uh, here's a plot of employment, share of employment in agriculture. This is from a paper of Bob Lucas's. And you see that uh, 
poor countries have a very high fraction of labor in agriculture, despite their comparative disadvantage. Um, okay. And just to see a little bit of the time series here, this is also from Lucas, time series for four countries. You see for Japan, the US, and the UK, the shares in agriculture declining fast. For India, uh, up to 2000, they hadn't declined much at all. But if you, instead of time on the horizontal axis, you put GDP per worker, they, they line up pretty well. The shift out of agriculture into other occupations seems to follow a common pattern. Okay, so I'm basically a theorist, so I want to think about a theoretical model that's going to help us like try and, you know, think about all of this evidence. What's there and what's missing. And so for the theoretical model, I'm going to go back to a paper of Jovanovich and McDonald and uh, to look at a very sim simplified version of the model they have. So think about an industry where there are, just, there are two technology levels, an old technology and a new one. Um, uh, the, uh, adopters are going to have to make a, you know, a, a dynamic decision. So we'll think about a constant interest rate. And to start, we'll think about pr industry prices being constant over time. We can relax that later. Now the key uh, state variable in this model is going to be the fraction of firms or producers that have already adopted the technology. Or you could think of the fraction of output that's produced with the new technology. Either way, you could, uh, that that's going to be the industry state variable. Okay, so let's go back and think about hybrid corn. We want to explain differences across regions. Um, we don't need any capital investment. The inputs may be uh, more expensive for the hybrids, but the yields are also higher. Um, but we can just kind of roll all that into a change in profitability per acre of land. And just think of pi ij as the profit per acre for technology i, the old or new and uh, the region, so uh, yields vary a lot by region. The other thing that varies is firm sizes. They vary within a region, they also vary across regions. Um, so we're going to need a, a firm size, a farm size distribution, um, so we can posit that. And okay, so we're off and running. But if we just take the model that far, it's like either the new hybrids, either it's profitable or it's not. If it's profitable, everybody should adopt instantaneously. If it's not, they're never going to adopt. Okay, so we need something else to get, you know, uh, slow diffusion. So suppose there's a one-time fixed cost to adopting the new technology. You can think that is the cost of, uh, you know, learning about the new hybrid. Um, And the key thing is going to be that this cost, this fixed cost is going to decline with the, the penetration that's already occurred. So for, for corn, we could imagine that, you know, the farmers talk to the other farmers in their region. If other people have adop adopted, you pick up information about that's going to help you adopt at a lower fixed cost. So we'll, let, uh, we'll have a, fixed, a function C that falls with the rate of penetration so, thus far. So the fraction of farms or the fact, fraction of acreage. Okay, so now we have to think about intertemporal trade-offs. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll suppose now that this, this cost function, the function itself is the same across regions, but uh, you know, if firm size very, if the distribution of firm size, farm size varies, then the penetration is going to, penetration rate is going to vary. Okay, so let's think about the value of a farmer with, who's currently got technology I in region J, Z is the size of his farm, and nu is the current state in his region, the state variable. 
So a farm that's already adopted doesn't have to make any other decisions. They just collect the higher rate of profits forever, and that's their value. A, firm that's still, a farm that still has the old technology um, has to decide, adopt this period or wait and decide next period. So if they adopt, then they become a V1 and pay the fixed cost. If they wait, they get the lower profit level this period, um, but then they get an option to adopt next period. Now notice that when they make the decision next period, this industry state variable will have changed. So for if other farmers in their region are adopting this period, the cost you know, for this farmer is going to be lower if he waits until next period. So this uh, 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 law of motion for the uh, degree of penetration you know, that's an equilibrium object, so that's something we have to solve for in the model. Okay, so you can just, you can rearrange terms here and you see, you know, adopting immediately is the optimal choice if, you know, something or other on the left-hand side exceeds the current cost of adoption. And the important point about the stuff on the left is just, it's increasing in farm <coughs> size. So, larger farms will adopt earlier. It's more worth, it's worth their while to pay the fixed cost, a bigger fixed cost, and pay it sooner. Okay, but notice firm, firms don't adopt on the first date when adopting now is better than uh, never adopting. If they had to make a choice now or never, that's not the choice they're making because the, the, the decision to wait in, includes an option value of adopting in the future, and that, that's, uh, that's valuable. So if you wait, you delay the arrival of the gains, but you pay a lower fixed cost. Okay, so if you want to get a logistic pattern, uh, I mean, they, then you have like sort of two things to play with. One is the, the, this cost function, and the other is the distribution of uh, farm sizes. Now, so if you wanted to fit Relicus's data, I guess, you know, I guess we want to keep the cost function the same across regions. And the distribution of sizes is, it is what it is. And Grilicus's data says, you know, in uh, that, uh, you know, so diffusion is going to depend on these distribution of sizes. Um, another, thing, another way you could do it is just to posit also uh, some kind of idiosyncratic component to the fixed cost. That would also work. You know, what do we know about these fixed costs? I would say, like, almost nothing. It's kind of like the quadratic adjustment cost in macro models. It's just, that's our fudge factor. We put it in to help fit the data. Okay, if we think about Mansfield's uh, study, I would say it's, it's not very different at all. Um, his, his, uh, his technologies have a, a, a big investment component. Um, but you could either roll that into the cost of adoption, or you could say, just think of the, like, the implicit rental rate on the new equipment and roll that into the profit function. So it uh, works you know, in a very, very similar way. Um, and if you think about why the fixed cost falls with adoption by others in your industry, you know, maybe there's some industry-wide learning Maybe you can poach workers from your rival who's already adopted, and that's going to help you adopt at a lower cost. Or maybe the equipment declines in price over time because, uh, because of learning by doing it, the producing firm. Okay, if, now if we wanted to take this same kind of model and think about cross-country diffusion, they, there's a new element, which I haven't talked at all about wage rates. And if we look across countries to try and explain adoption patterns, wage rates, you know, they're going to have to be key because they vary a lot across countries, you know, from rich to poor, and they're going to affect a lot the profitability of, uh, you know, uh, bringing in these new technologies. So a lot of new technologies are, you know, capital using and labor saving. 
So wages are going to be at the, at the center of the story. Okay, but I want to think about how I can like just modify this little model uh, a bit um, to uh, think about cross-country evidence. So suppose that the cost of the new equipment is similar across countries. That in you know it makes sense. They're all buying from the same suppliers. Who they're they're like someplace they're the exporting countries. Uh, interest and depreciation rates are similar. And so the user cost of the new equipment is going to be similar across countries. The big difference across countries is going to be the wage rate. So uh, the, if these technologies are labor saving, the, the gain from adoption is going to be smaller and perhaps non-existent if wages are low. So for a concrete example, we could think about uh, comparing an old technology that uses labor only and a new technology that uses labor and capital. So uh, there are my two production functions. Uh, the, the old technology is just uh, labor. It's, it's, strictly, it's a strictly concave, so they're decreasing returns to scale. Uh, the new technology, I'm going to hold the returns to scale the same, just for simplicity. Um, that the, uh, the aggregate input is now an aggregate of capital and labor. And the uh, level parameter AI, we can think of as just a producer fixed effect, and so that it's going to affect the size, it's going to control the size of different producers. And we could have a, just a level shifter B. If we have that, I want to make that level shifter the same across producers. Um, so that's it. So now, the, uh, the, let's say the output price and the, the, the user cost of capital is the same across countries. What's the difference is the wage rate. So what's the, what's the potential gain from adopting this new technology in country J? Um, well, if you take these two little uh, production functions, you can calculate profits as a function of uh, the input prices and the output price. And, you know, there you are. You see that it depends on the wage and the price for technology one and, you know, the wage and the return on capital for technology, the, te the new technology. And uh, if we look at the difference, we see the gain, the gain from adoption for this little example takes a very simple form. Um, it depends on the ratio of the wage rate to the price of capital. And uh, so that term embraces could have either sign. And the magnitude of the gain or loss from adoption depends on is linear in A. So if it's profitable to adopt, it's especially profitable for big producers to adopt. Okay, so will they adopt or not? It depends on this, uh, on the wage rate, the local wage rate. And then it's also going to depend on the fixed cost. So uh, for large producers, if, this, if it's a positive gain uh, and big enough, it may worthwhile, be worthwhile to, you know, uh, uh, incur the fixed costs if, um, and you know, if you're a large producer but not necessarily for a small producer. So you can get the same kind of diffusion that we got in the first model. Uh, the second point is if wages change over time, it might be that this technology is not, you know, when it first comes online, it's not worthwhile. But if wage rates rise in the producer's country, then later it becomes uh, worthwhile. But in any case, the model suggests that the, the, uh, a way to think about adoption of these technologies across countries is to look at you know, wage rates across countries. Um, I guess the distribution of firm size is also important. If these fixed costs, you know, if they're uh, independent of firm size, you know, tiny firms are going to have a hard time adopting. Um, if it's a technology that requires skilled labor, then we have to think about the appropriate wage rate for um, these technologies.
Okay, now if we try and take this kind of model to think about a, like a two-sector world with agriculture and non-agriculture as the two sectors, um, and that kind of model has been used extensively in the literature to look at a lot of things, employment patterns, you know, productivity gaps, wage rates. Um, I think it could also be used to look at diffusion. And um, as I said, the, the, the key here is that these uh, equipment, the data on equipment imports is quite good, and that's where the equipment comes from. Um, so it's kind of a, a clean, clean experiment. So it's, you know, it's, it's, there's a recent paper by Chen who, you know, kind of follows more or less this line. And he's, he's pretty successful. So for agriculture, he assumes there's, you know, that I would say that the difficulty, uh, at least from a theoretical perspective, is now we're getting more inputs. So if you want to have capital, if for ag agriculture, you certainly want to have land. Uh, I guess, you know, and then there's capital, and then is, is there labor, is there a rural labor market to hire uh, labor? So he shuts down the labor market and uh, just looks at growers who uh, choose capital and land and looks at this same, really very same kind of uh, model where the new technology is more capital intensive. And he, he fits some convergence, some, some growth patterns pretty well. But I think there's, you know, probably there are a lot of other possibilities. When we think about agriculture, I mean, it's, if you think about mechanization, you know, does, what, what does uh, farm equipment do? I guess to some extent, I think it probably does. It's labor, labor saving, capital using. Its relationship with land is maybe more complicated. Maybe it makes larger farms, you know, more uh, attractive. So it depends on whether there's a rental market for uh, tractor services, shall we say. So you have to think about whether you know, equipment is, you know, is a substitute or a complement to land. Does it change the farmer's span of control? I guess at some point we want it to change the span of control because the whole point of this exercise is at some point development moves people out of agriculture. So we're going to have to get improve productivity that like that frees up labor which is going to be moving into the city so this i think is you know, all right so you know there should be at least pretty